The Colorado Trail Race is hands down my favorite race of the year. And not only because it's my personal favorite to race or being close to home, but it offers one of the best dot watching experiences for a solid week. So I had a lot of fun looking at the rigs submitted by racers for this year's rigs of the Colorado Trail Race. So in this video, I dive a bit deeper into the rigs in hopes of finding some trends and surprises. Let's do it. The 18th annual Colorado Trail Race started on Sunday, August 11th, and the single track heavy self-supported race is roughly 530 miles with 75,000 feet of climbing, featuring many rough stretches and hike bikes, all at high elevations, with many mountain passes above 12,000 and one at 13,000. So the race changes direction each year, but being an even year, the race this year is going to start in D Denver and finish in Durango. And and it's been a really wet start to August, and that monsoon moisture looks to continue, which should make for some really exciting conditions out there. But nothing truly out of the ordinary for August in Colorado. All right, so I ended up plugging in the first 40 rigs that we received for the rigs of submissions into the spreadsheet right here, which definitely helped me get this data. Uh, and it's not all of the racers in the race, but it is a pretty good data set. So before we dive any further, I just wanna take a quick moment to let you all know that this video is partially supported by Tailfin. Tailfin designs and engineers technical bikepacking equipment for almost any kind of adventure. Innovation and quality are at the heart of what makes them tick, and their constant strive to create better performing gear means that you can just focus on enjoying the ride. They offer a range of options for hauling your gear, whether you're tackling a race like the Tour Divide or the Colorado Trail Race, or just escaping for an overnighter. So for more on Tailfin, be sure to click the card in the top right corner, or also follow the link in the description below. So events like the Colorado, Arizona, and Highland Trail Races are much more single track focused, so we tend to see more mountain bike oriented rigs, and that certainly showed here with 22 complete full suspension bikes and 17 hardtails and only one rigid bike. Of the 39 bikes with suspension forks, the most popular travel size was 120 millimeters among hardtails and full suspension bikes, as you see here in these two graphs. But there were some really big travel bikes in this group, like three 150 millimeter shreddy hardtails and even one 160, 160 full suspension bike. That being said, I'm really surprised to not see as many trail bikes, seeing as how fast and capable they have become over the last handful of years. Now, there was a wide range of bikes in this group with 23 brands being represented and 26 different types of bikes being represented. The most popular brand was Specialized and Santa Cruz with four each, followed by Esker, Pivot, Salsa, and Transition with three each. The most popular bikes were custom ones, followed by a five-way tie with three Esker Hey Dukes, three Pivot Trail 429s, three Specialized Epics, three Transition Spurs, and three Salsa Timberjacks. All right, so half of the bikes were carbon, with most of them being of the full suspension variety, except this Starling Cycles beady little eye. What a beaut. The other 50% were metal, with eight being steel, seven titanium, and five aluminum bikes. Oh, and it is worth mentioning that there is 39 flat bar bikes out there, and yes, you got it one drop bar bike. Just like the Tour Divide and the other three rig stat videos that I've done, I'm not going to surprise you at all with drivetrains here. The most popular drivetrain brand was SRAM with 60% of the bikes using it, followed by 20% using Shimano and the remaining 20% using a single speed setup. In total, 30 bikes were set up with 1x12 drivetrains, two 1x11 drivetrain, and eight one speeders. Of those single speed bikes, the most popular gearing was 32-22 with three rigs, but there were a bunch of different ratios out there as you can see here. All right, so of the geared bikes, there were 33 that were mechanical and only seven electronic, all of which were SRAM access. So that's over 80% using mechanical versus 69% using mechanical on the Tour Divide, something kind of interesting there. And of the one by 12 and one by 11 setups, the most popular chain ring was 30 teeth with 12, followed by 32 with 10, and that tiny little 28 tooth with 
eight. And surprisingly, there were zero pinion, roll off, two by or three by setups. All right, so among ultra riders, wheels and tires are perhaps the most talked about uh, component outside of maybe chain ring size and gearing. They're easily replaceable and can make a world of difference, especially on the Colorado Trail. This trail features a mix of really fast wilderness detours and rough technical sections. So the goal really is to find a nice balanced tire. And while there is some debate about tires, really there's zero debate about wheel size. Almost all of the rigs went with 29 inch wheels. Only one rider chose 27.5, but used plus tires essentially making making it a 29er at heart. Talking about tire size, over half of the racers opted for 2.4 inch tires, followed by 11 racers choosing 2.6 inch tires, six racers going with 2.3 to 2.35 inch tires, and various other sizes followed. This is all very refreshing to see. There was not one 2.2 inch tire. All right, so unlike the Tour Divide where Vittoria tires, particularly the Mezcals, were dominant on about 50% of the bikes, Max's tires are the favorite for at least this race. Approximately 70% of racers used Max's with the remaining 30% spread across eight other brands. So among Max's tires, the Recon was the most popular, used by 15 racers. 16 other tire models were mentioned, but none came close to the popularity of that recon. And it is worth noting that the Mezcal did not appear in any of the 40 rigs that were submitted. It's just shocking to me. All right, so there had been a trend with racks recently on big rides, like say the Tour Divide, which makes sense, but they still are not widely adopted in trail races. Of the 40 bikes, only five, five, had racks, with a few using aero packs, a few using Elkhorn racks, and one using an aero spider rack. More surprisingly here was maybe that there were only 24 seat packs, leaving 11 bikes without any rear system at all. So many of these bikes were full suspension models with dropper posts, which certainly helped provide that clearance to run your full dropper without anything hitting the rear tire. This all makes sense. Speaking of dropper posts, nearly 90% of racers were using them, leaving only five without. Personally, I couldn't imagine riding the route without a dropper. I did, actually, uh, probably twice, but I would never do that again. Uh, it's just, it would lead to a lot of downhill hiking, which is just not very fun. All right, so regarding bags, there wasn't much brand loyalty with only a few sponsored athletes actually showing preference here. However, one thing I did notice was dispersed bike packing bags. They're doing really well in this ultra race scene uh, with many bikes being equipped with their custom frame bags and other bags. Finally, most of the folks had zero cargo on their fork with only four bikes using fork cargo and all of which were using water bottle storage, which I actually found to be quite interesting. I figured there would be a few more. All right, so some other random findings here. Most racers preferred the clipless pedal system with 28 folks using it and 11 folks using flat pedals and one individual was using a mixed pedal. And interestingly enough, Five of the eight single speeders were using flat pedals. So only 12.5% of racers were using a dynamo hub with the rest carrying either extra batteries or cash batteries to charge their devices like GPS units or lights. So I actually ended up using a dynamo hub one year, but it didn't provide that desired output at such a slow average speed, which definitely explains the limited use in this race. This year we did ask racers about their navigation devices that they're using and well, Garmin, certainly was very popular with 27 Garmin devices in use. This includes 11 of their Solar Edge units, nine E-Trex units, six standard Garmin Edge units, and one Phoenix watch. Additionally, 11 racers were using Wahoo devices with a collection of other brands filling in the rest. And regarding lights, Phoenix was a very popular choice with half of the bikes using at least one Phoenix light, uh, mostly the Phoenix BC26R. This light is a favorite because it comes with this removable and rechargeable battery, which basically eliminates the need to 
charge the light itself. Rather, you could just charge the battery or bring extra batteries. I own two of these lights and I absolutely love them. There were also a variety of other dynamo and non-dynamo lights in use. So a sleeping bag or quilt combined with a bivy sack was the most popular option used by roughly half of the racers. Sleeping bags and tents were also very popular and in my own experience, uh, just using various systems, I definitely found that the bag and bivy combination was the most comfortable and the quickest to set up and get into at night. All right, so as of Thursday, August 8th, 91 participants had signed up on the track leaders page. Two of these are an out and back return foot travel dots of Alexander Houchin and Hunter Hamilton. So this leaves roughly 89 individuals, 78 men and 11 women. Sure, there are going to be more participating, but that's what we have on track leaders as of Thursday. All right, so the age distribution of racers is actually really interesting here with generally younger group than the Tour Divide. The most popular age group for this ride is 30 to 39, representing roughly 40% of the participants. This is followed by 40 to 49 age group at 30% and 20 to 29, rounding out the top three at 15%. Notably, there is one 72 year old participating which is truly inspiring to see. All right, so in terms of, I'd say geographic representation here, there's certainly less of a worldwide presence than other races like the Tour Divide or other kind of road heavy races. It's still notable though that there are seven countries represented, Spain, Lithuania, Belgium, Ecuador, New Zealand with two participants, Canada with three, and the USA, which dominates with 79 participants. All right, so within the US, 20 states were represented, and as expected, Colorado leads the way with 41 participants, followed by Arizona with five, North Carolina with four, and several states with three racers each. And given that the finish line is in Durango, it is no surprise that this town has the highest representation with eight racers getting to pedal home, which is actually a really pretty awesome feeling. The start location, Denver, is the second most popular location with five, followed by Gunnison, my home, where I'm recording this right now, with four racers, and Boulder and Louisville round out the top five, each with three racers. So overall, 55 different towns or cities across the United States were represented. So there you have it the stats of the 2024 Colorado Trail Race. Did anything stand out to you? If so, let me know in the comment section below. As always, thank you all so much for watching. And if you like what you saw in this video and wanna see a little bit more like it, please hit that subscribe button and notification bell. And if you wanna help support this YouTube channel, everything we do on bikepacking.com, you can do so by signing up for the Bikepacking Collective. The collective offers a lot of awesome perks, including industry discounts, monthly giveaways, and the twice yearly bikepacking journal. Plus, we have a lot of really awesome information coming down the pipeline, so stay tuned for that. So to learn a little bit more, you can click on the card in the top right corner, or also follow the link in the description below. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, pedal further.